The Everlasting Now, Chapter 11 In late afternoon, dark thunderclouds began building in the west. Lily brought the clothes in and left to go to the farm before the rain caught her. The sky was glassy, the air smelled of sulfur, and the birds grew quiet. The rain began drifting across the fields in silvery sheets. Fat drops pocked the dust, flattening on the boards of the porch. Check the upstairs windows for me, brother, Mama called from the dining room. Rain drummed heavily on the roof as I went from room to room, closing windows. I was on my way downstairs when I saw Sheriff Ham standing at the front screen door. His shirt was wet and rain glistened on his polished boots. I knew this was going to happen. I knew it. Once Mama made that call to the mayor, I was dead. I wanted to pretend I didn't see him and go back upstairs, but I couldn't. My stomach felt like it was going to fall out. There was a ringing in my ears. He peered through the screen door and saw me. Tell your mama I'm here, he said. I didn't say anything. I just turned and went into the dining room. For a minute, I stood there looking at mama. She was laying out a dress pattern on the dining room table. The thin tissue paper crinkled under her fingertips as she pinned the pattern to the material. Swan sat in a corner dressing her dolls from scraps of cloth light as summer butterflies. Mama, I whispered. I was so scared my voice sounded squeaky. The sheriff's outside in the porch. In the muted light from the windows, Mama's face was pale. Have him come in, she said. Then you and Swan make yourself scarce. I'm not going to leave you alone with him, I told her. It'll be all right, she said. Swan and I hid behind the hall door. When he first went into the room, I heard him say he was sorry about upsetting her. Sorry, my foot, I thought. He didn't look like he was sorry. I bet he only said it because the mayor made him. Then I couldn't make out any more words, just a kind of mumbling. A few minutes later, he walked back down the hall and out to the porch. Mama didn't walk to the door with him the way she did with regular company. We waited a second. Then we left our hiding place and watched as he left the porch and went down the steps. The rain had ended. The air was fresh and clean. Steam rose from the ground. The sheriff stomped down the front path, his boots crunching on the gravel. Then he walked toward the gate, brushing past the tea roses that tumbled over the front fence. We followed him out to the yard, and Shirley Bollegi followed us, lifted her paws delicately over the wet grass. Swan picked her up. When Sheriff Ham reached the gate, Swan called out to him, her voice high and thin as a penny whistle. You old bully, she said. You ought not to be mean to folks. It's bad manners. I was so shocked I couldn't move. The sheriff stopped and turned to face us. His face grew red, and he puffed up like a toad. He glared at Swan, but she didn't waver. She held her ground, her skinny legs trembling, her cat in her arms. Well, little missy, he said in a low voice, it's a fine cat you got there. Let's hope it's got nine lives like it's supposed to. Then he turned and opened the gate. Waves of anger swept over me, winds rushed through my head, and the air around me turned black. Stepping in front of Swan, I grabbed a handful of wet clay, kneading it into a hard clod. I took aim, threw it, and hit him smack in the middle of his fat back. That's her champion, I said. Then I grabbed Swan's hand and we ran back to the house in safety. Mama was standing at the front door and she saw me throw the clod. When the sheriff got in the car and left, she called me. Come on, brother, she said. I could see she was upset. I tried to tell her I didn't plan to throw the clod. It just happened because I was so mad. I understand, she said, but anger just produces anger. I think you need to calm down and stay close to home for a while. How long, I asked. A week, she said. I don't understand grown-ups, not even my mother. But I never said I was sorry for what I did, because it wasn't. I wasn't. It was worth it. I never pitched that good before in my life. It was a long week. The whole time I was confined to the house, I kept waiting for the sheriff to come back and arrest me. But he didn't. I kept a good lookout, though. If I saw him coming, I was going to escape out the back. Lily kept giving me sideways looks. She said Champion wasn't allowed to come to the house. I couldn't go fishing, and when I asked her if Jesse and Champion had been, she just said, I don't know what they're up to. Where can I expect? The railroad men didn't show up the whole time I was in prison. Then at breakfast, Mama poured herself a coffee and made an announcement. Your ordeal has ended, she said. That same day, I was in the backyard weeding the flower beds. Not because I was still in trouble, but because Mama said they needed it. Swan was up in the chinaberry tree, singing at the top of her lungs. Throw out the lifeline across the dark wave. There is a brother who someone should save someone's brother. Oh, who will then will dare to throw out the lifeline, his peril to share. 
Every time she said the word brother, she sang louder. Champion came around the corner of the house. I was surprised to see him, even though Mama and Lily had decided he could come over. We weren't allowed to go to town or any place else where the sheriff or Mr. Linton might see us. It was too dangerous. He waved to Swan, who was still singing. Don't let on like you hear her, I said. She's just showing off. What have you been doing while I was in prison? Moving pigs, he said. I was surprised. He didn't like pigs any better than he did mules. Grandpapa was fixing the pig pen, he explained. So we had to put him in the shade so they wouldn't get sunstroke. Oh, so you had to move him. That made sense. Swan started in the chorus. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is dying away, away, away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. Help me finish weeding, I said. Then let's get out of here. I'm going stir crazy. After we finished the flower beds, we piled the weeds in the wheelbarrow and took them to the compost heap. That's when we decided to go down to the railroad tracks. Nobody will bother us down there, I said. Only don't tell Swan where we're going. She'll want to come too. I helped Swan down from the chinaberry tree. She told Champion I'd be punished. It wasn't fair, she said. Go tell Mama we'll be back in a little while, I said. Okay, she said. She picked up her cat and went inside. As we sneaked out the backyard, I told Champion why I'd been punished. You really hit the sheriff with a clod? All Aunt Lily told me was you was in trouble and couldn't leave the house, and I couldn't come see you. I told him what the sheriff had said to Swan. He was mean to her about the cat. Maybe he's mad. Him picking on a little girl. All of a sudden, I was aiming for him. You did right. What Shirley Balagi ever do to him? What'd you ever do to him, I said. Brother, he said, after you hit him, were you scared? No, I said, but I told a lie. I was scared. I still am. I kept thinking about him and what he might do. Mama said to give him a wide berth. What's that mean? He asked. It's what I asked. And she said it means to stay far away from him as I can. And I'd be glad to. Only I never know when I'll see him. After that, we called him all the bad names we knew. Champion knew more bad words than I did. I believe some folks talk worse in Detroit than in Snow Hill, I said. Some do, some don't, he said. Chapter 12 The railroad track smelled cindery in the hot sun. Dragonflies hovered over grass that was cut to stubble for the train's passage. If we'd had some pennies, we'd have put them on the tracks for the train to flatten, but we didn't have any. Hey, said Champion. Know what we could do? What? We could hop a freight to Joe Lewis's training camp. Where is it? New Jersey? New Jersey, are you crazy? Why, that might be just well as France or someplace. What do you know about France? He asked. I love Paris. I love France. Where they don't wear no underpants, I sang. Champion was laughing as he walked ahead of me down the tracks. Suddenly, he stopped stock still, and I bumped into him. A big colored man was stretched out on the side of the tracks, his hat sideways on his head. We eased over and stood looking down at him. Is he dead? I whispered. Suddenly, his big hand shot out and grabbed my ankle. I was so scared my eyes were watering, but when I tried to pull away, it was like I was caught in a vice. Looking through the mist, I saw a champion scrambling to get me out of the way. But he was too slow. The man reached out and with his other hand grabbed champion's ankle. Yikes! Champion hollered at the top of his lungs. You could have heard him yelling all the way to Bose. Whoa, hold on there, said the man. I ain't gonna hurt you. Amos Ragsdale never hurt nobody. For somebody who nearly scared us to death, Amos, Amos Ragsdale turned out to be a nice man. A hobo, he was on his way to Florida to pick fruit. Why were you laying by the tracks, I asked. We thought you were dead. I lay alongside so I can feel the train coming a long way off, he explained. You see, I've been riding sidecar Pullmans, what you call boxcars, for three years now. You gotta be careful riding the rails. I looked over at Champion, who ignored me. Some places, said Amos, the law will catch you and put you in a chain gang. Once, the railroad bulls took me off a train and arrested me for vagrancy. They called me a vagrant. How old do you have to be for them to call you a vagrant? I asked, thinking about being put in a chain gang. Old as they say, he answered. So if you boys was thinking about riding the rails, think again. Crows called over the warm, empty fields that smelled of grass. The rails were hot to the touch and shone silvery in the sun. Amos wiped the sweat from his face with a red bandana. Last time I got out of jail, they gave me 35 cents and a pair of overalls. 
being a hobo ain't all it's cracked up to be. Sometimes you go hungry. That was one time. I knocked on folks' doors for food. Wouldn't nobody feed me. My mama would have, I said, and Lily. They'd give you support. They'd give you supper. So, you got a mama? Amos asked. I do. He looked at Champion. You got a mama? In Detroit? He replied. But my Aunt Lily's been here. She's the one you was speaking of, he asked me. The same one, I said. You boys get on home to your mama and your aunt, he said. It ain't safe out here. Let's go, I said. In late evening, Chimney Swift started and swooped over the treetops, and the steady drone of crickets hummed on the warm air. Mama came downstairs, dressed up in a white dress and red polka dots. Brother, you and Swan go get cleaned up now. We're going to church this evening. I've been to church once this week, I said. Well, you can go again to hear Miss Eaton. She's a missionary who flew out of China in an American Volunteer Corps plane. Japanese troops were shooting at him. That took real courage. Just imagine that. I'd have to imagine courage. I sure didn't have any. All I knew about was being a scared. Is the pilot going to be there too? I asked. Of course not, said Mama. Then I don't want to go here, a missionary lady. Might do you some good, she said. Besides, I said, thinking of a good reason not to go. The shadow comes on tonight. Lily already said Champion could come over if it's all right with you. I don't know, brother. I'm not sure about leaving you two here alone. Lamont Cranston will foil another horrifying plot, I said, put my arm across my face like Dracula. I'll go with you, Mama, said Swan. I don't like that spooky show. If I'd stayed home, brother tried to scare me. I would not. Sometimes I wanted to pinch her as hard as I could, but I knew better. Nobody will even know he's here, I said. She finally gave in, and when Champion arrived, she told us the rules. If it rains, check the windows, lock the doors when we leave, and don't let anybody in. Turn on the porch light so if anyone comes to the door, you'll know who it is. If it's a stranger, don't open it. A little while later, the Maxwell crunched down the gravel drive and rumbled over the cattle gap. I had just turned on the radio when the telephone rang. By the time I finished telling Mrs. Holman where Mama had gone and why, it was time for our program. Shadows cloaked the corners of the house. A single lamp burned in the hall. Candle flies searched out. The rose-patterned light flew too close and fell onto the hall table. In the parlor, the radio lights glowed soft gold. We wanted the room dark because it made the program scarier. It was one time I liked being scared because it wasn't real. I hadn't turned on the porch lights, but I would before Mama got home. Champion sat cross-legged in front of the radio, holding Shirley Bollegay in his arms. I lay down on the floor. Organ music swelled and filled the high-ceiling room. Then a voice, low and menacing, whispered, Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. Shirley Bollegy pricked up her ears and stared into the darkened hall. I hate it when cats do that. Like they can see or hear something we can't. Gives me the creeps. Then I heard something too. Creak, creak, creak. Footsteps moved stealthily across the floorboards of the porch. I sat up. Champion looked at me, his eyes wide. Shirley leaped from his arms, her ears laid back, her body flattened as she slipped under the sofa, pulling her tail in after her. There was a rasping noise at the front door, scrabble, 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 like a rat scratching against a wall. I waited for a knock, but none came. The scratching grew more desperate, filling the hollows and dark places of the old house. I was pretty sure it wasn't a hobo. They always came to the back door and never at night. We tiptoed over to the front window and, easing back the curtain, peeked out. A figure stood in the shadows, his face hidden. A cloud passed over the moon. The porch grew dark and the figure became part of the darkness. I forgot to lock the door. I whispered. I did it, said Champion, and I didn't turn on the porch light. I was busy talking to Miss Holman. The moon came out from behind the clouds. Our night visitor took shape, although his face was in shadow. But I knew him, even in the dark. I knew him. It was Mr. Linton. I saw him on my way over here, said Champion. He was going down the road in front of me, and he was walking funny. How could he know he was here? I whispered. Maybe he saw the car leave, said Champion. If he did, he figured we'd be here and Miss Serena isn't. Or maybe he watched me come up to the house. The scrabbling noise stopped, and in the sudden silence, the hateful sound lingered like smoke. Footsteps moved toward the window. Easing up to the windowsill, I closed my eyes and braced myself to look out. My worst nightmare is looking into the dark and seeing someone or something looking back at me. Taking a deep breath, I looked through the darkened glass. Deep, hollow eyes stared back at me. I stumbled backwards, knocking the breath out of Champion, who was right behind me. He hit the floor like a sack of meal. Oof, he said, rolling over and getting it to his knees. For a minute, we was 
We just stayed on the floor. We heard him stumble back from the window. Peeking out again, we watched as he walked kind of lopsided over to the edge of the porch. He stood for a moment, weaving back and forth, then lurching down the steps. He wandered across the lawn. We counted to ten, then eased down the front hall, staying close to the wall. The black glass, the glass panels of the sides of the front door shone blackly. Ready? I said, reaching for the door handle. Ready, whispered Champion. The sweet, cloying scent of honeysuckle washed over us. We hid behind a column covered by the trembling leaves of wisteria and looked out into the yard. Only the leaves moved. Our night visitor was gone. He was drunk, wasn't he? Champion said. Drunk and mean, I said. We were sitting on the uh, front steps. For some reason, we felt safer outside, maybe because the house seemed so big and empty. We heard the rumble of the cattle gap. Get ready to run, I said, but then the lights of the Maxwell cut a swath through the night. Mama and Swan came up the walk. Why are you boys out here in the dark? Did the power go off? No, ma'am, I said. I bet they've been trying to scare each other, said Swan. No, we weren't, I said. Champion looked over at me and nodded his head. I have to tell you something. I have something to tell you, I said. What What happened, Mama asked. Mr. Linton came by and kind of scratched on the door, I said, but we didn't open it. I'm pretty sure he was drunk. I had a bad feeling about leaving you all here alone, said Mama. That sorry piece of work is no business coming to buy this house. I won't have it. Heat lightning lit up the sky like distant fireworks. The thin twanging of rain frogs rose and fell. Champion got to his feet. I best be going now, he said. Aunt Lily might get worried. I knew he was scared stiff to go out in the dark alone. I would be. We'll drive you home, said Mama. It's not safe out with that man wandering around. Just let me go turn on some more lights and we'll go. After she heard Swan's prayers, Mama came and sat on my bed. The bedside lamp made a halo around her hair. You're not keeping something from me, are you? I laid my book down. No, ma'am, I told you the truth. I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Linton, but I couldn't see his face too good. Mama got up and adjusted the fan at the foot of my bed so it would rotate back and forth. You tell me if you do see him around here and stay away from him. Pay attention to what's going on. I hope I don't ever see him again as long as I live. 